The story of the Mormon Battalion is a unique chapter in the history of the West. It is a story of people, men and women, who were willing to sacrifice for what they believed. Their story has an unusual beginning. From 1830 to 1846, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, nicknamed Mormons, experienced almost constant persecution. Time and again, they were driven from their homes, deprived of their rights and property. Among them were Ezra and Sarah Allen. The Latter-day Saints, including the Allen family, found temporary refuge in the state of Illinois. Within a few years, Nauvoo, their city on the banks of the Mississippi, rivaled Chicago in size. It seemed a haven from all the troubles of the past. It was in Nauvoo that another couple, William Corey and Melissa Burden, met and fell in love. William proposed marriage and Melissa accepted. But the peace and happiness of Nauvoo was short-lived. In 1844, Joseph Smith, the leader of the church, was killed by a mob. Homes and property outside the city were destroyed. And finally, in order to avoid further conflict, Brigham Young agreed that the Latter-day Saints would leave the state. Early in February 1846, the exodus of an entire city began. Ezra and Sarah, and William and Melissa put their lives and happiness on hold, and once again left behind almost all that they possessed, starting out across the river toward an unknown destination. By spring, almost 20,000 members of the church were scattered across the Iowa prairie. June 22, 1846, William and Melissa were married. Four days later, their happiness was interrupted when five men in uniform rode into camp. At the request of the President of the United The officer in charge, Captain Allen, announced that he had orders to enlist 500 Mormons in the war with Mexico. The enlistment came in response to a request by the leaders of the church for a way to help finance the immigration west. Still, it came as a shock to the families who first heard about it there on the prairie. It was quite a hard pill to swallow, to leave wives and children destitute and almost helpless, and go fight the battles of a government that had allowed some of its citizens to drive us from our homes. President Brigham Young said, the salvation of the church depended upon raising the army. When I heard this, my mind changed. I felt it was my duty to go. 496 volunteers mustered in, among them Ezra Allen and William Corey. The battalion was about to begin the longest infantry march in U.S. military history. It was not an easy thing saying goodbye to their families there on the prairie, wondering if they would ever see them again. The idea of being separated from her new husband didn't set well with 18-year-old Melissa. I don't see why women must always stay behind and worry about their husbands when they could just as well march beside them. Melissa signed up as a laundress. July 20th, the battalion marched away. They took little food except some flour and whatever they could carry. A blanket, a few clothes, a tin cup. July 24th, marched five miles. The weather, excessively hot. July 25th, no flour. Many went to bed fasting. Marched 20 miles and camped. My feet are very sore. 
Melissa and the other women who volunteered as laundresses willingly shared the rigors of the journey. August 1st, the battalion reported for duty at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Each man received a musket and a few supplies, as well as a yearly clothing allowance of $42. Most sent the money back to help their families rather than buy uniforms. The only standard article all soldiers had was a white belt and instructions to keep it clean. From Fort Leavenworth, the battalion took its march to Santa Fe, and Brigham Young's promise was fulfilled. Though there will be battles fought in your front and in your rear, on your right and on your left, you will not have any fighting to do. Still, the battalion would endure many hardships. Saturday, August 15th. Our march was slow, the heat intense, the suffering of the sick intolerable. If anything was ailing any of the men, cold or blistered feet or anything else, the doctor would give a dose of calomel and arsenic. All were treated alike. By the time the battalion reached Santa Fe, over 150 were sick and had to be sent to Pueblo, Colorado to recover. September 26th, 23 miles, no rest. March is the daily task. Sick or well, sleep on the rough, cold ground with only one blanket to shelter from the cold. Some of the men recorded bits of poetry in their journals. How hard to starve and wear us out upon this sandy desert route. We sometimes now, for lack of bread, are less than quarter rations fed. At Santa Fe, the battalion was ordered to forge a wagon road to the Pacific Ocean. This morning, all awoke in a storm. Sunk nearly everything we had. As they struggled through New Mexico and Arizona, the terrain became increasingly difficult. The journey must have been especially difficult for Melissa, who was pregnant. Still, she went on with unfailing courage. I didn't mind it. I walked because I wanted to. My husband had to walk, and I went along with him. The war with Mexico was at an end by the time the battalion reached San Diego in January 1847. In their ragged state, they looked more like survivors than soldiers. In March of 1847, San Diego was just a village, a plaza surrounded by a church, a few stores and houses. Company B was assigned to peacetime garrison there. While they waited discharge, the company set to work assisting the villagers of San Diego. Carpenters finished houses, fences and buildings were whitewashed. A courthouse was constructed, the first brick building in the town. Perhaps most helpful were the 20 wells they dug and lined with bricks, making fresh water readily available. July 4, 1847, the battalion raised the American flag over Los Angeles. Gentlemen, you are discharged. One year after bidding goodbye to their families, the Mormon battalion was discharged. They didn't know where Brigham Young and the rest of the church were but they were on their way to find them. A year earlier, in July of 1846, 238 Latter-day Saints, under the leadership of Sam Brannan, had arrived in California on the ship Brooklyn. They became the first colonists in California under American rule. The old Californians were amazed at what they had brought with them, dry goods, tools, vegetable seeds, school supplies, and a library of 179 books. 
They had also brought a printing press and a supply of newsprint, everything needed to begin a newspaper. Following their discharge, many members of the battalion headed directly east to rejoin their families. But with speculation that Brigham Young and the rest of the church might continue on to California, some headed north. Among them, Ezra Allen and William and Melissa Corey. I thought it best to make my way fast as possible to San Francisco. But my wife, being in a delicate situation, I concluded to stop for a season in Monterey. October 2nd, 1847. My wife was delivered of a fine baby boy. I named him William, after myself. I have the greatest boy you ever saw. They planned to move to San Francisco as soon as she was well, but before they could leave, tragedy struck. Baby William died. They had only their faith to sustain them as they prepared to join their comrades in San Francisco. San Francisco is a beautiful place, a fine ship harbor. Things are improving rapidly. Under Brannan's leadership, the Latter-day Saints had started San Francisco's first school, its first bank, and first post office. The printing press had been put to good use. The first edition of the California Star reached the streets of San Francisco January 7, 1847. It was the city's first newspaper. Meanwhile, about 80 members of the discharged battalion had stopped at Sutter's Fort and accepted temporary work in order to purchase needed supplies. Captain John A. Sutter, being desirous of building a flouring mill some six miles from the fort and a sawmill about 45 miles away, proposed to hire all the men. Sutter had wanted to build the mills for some time, but lacked skilled labor to do it. The battalion members, many experienced craftsmen from the east, provided the solution. They worked on a variety of projects. Six were hired to build a sawmill in the mountains. We arrived on the 29th of September. The surrounding country looked wild and lonesome, infested with wolves and grizzly bears. Things progressed well until December. Then winter rains brought high, swift water, which slowed the work. In their downtime, the men built a log cabin so they could move out of the one they had been sharing with the Wimmer family. They moved in on January 23rd. The next morning, as they were digging the tail race deeper, the first gold flakes were spotted. Thanks to the journal entries of two of the men, the date of the find was recorded. Monday, January 24th, 1848. This day, some kind of metal was found in the tail of the race that looks like gold. It was first found by James W. Marshall, the boss of the mill. The metal passed every test, including the harsh lie of Mrs. Wimmer's soap kettle. The only thing left to do was convince John Sutter. He was skeptical at first. But when he paid a visit to the mill, Marshall and the others determined to help convince him by salting the race. The plan almost backfired when the Wimmer boys found the gold before Sutter did, but he had seen enough to be convinced. It wasn't long until word of the find spread and curious comrades visited their friends in Coloma. On one such trip, Sidney Wills and Wilford Hudson found more gold particles on a sandbar in the American River. The strike became known as Mormon Island and turned out to be the second major gold strike, one with very rich diggings. Meanwhile, the merchants in San Francisco were concerned that the city wasn't growing fast enough. They suggested a special edition of the California Star extolling the virtues of the city and the state. The paper was ready to print except for a couple of empty inches on an inside page when news of a gold discovery in Coloma reached San Francisco. Several battalion members were hired as express riders to carry copies of the Star East. And the few lines about gold which they carried cross country to St. Louis, Baltimore, New York, and other major cities of the East would trigger the gold rush of 49. Hordes of gold seekers flocked to Coloma from San Francisco and Monterey. Battalion members continued to work for Sutter, but in their spare time, they too joined in the search. 
It was mining in a primitive way. We had no pans, no lumber to make rockers, and so we used Indian baskets to pan with. We would dump the gold on a flour sack spread out upon the ground. At Mormon Island, Ezra and William tried their hand at panning for gold as well. But we did not stop there long. We were anxious to come to Salt Lake. After the discovery of gold, all my plans and projects came to naught. One after another, my people disappeared in the directions of the gold fields. Only the Mormons remained to finish their jobs. The Coloma mill was in regular operation by the end of March. The contract to finish the mill was fulfilled. No set of men was better situated to gain from the gold strike than the members of the battalion. Had they remained just another year, they would have become rich. But they were concerned about another goal, getting back to their families. A meeting was held at Sutter's Fort on April 9th to discuss plans for going. Sutter paid the soldiers in kind with horses, oxen, wagons, and other items they would need. And ironically, while much of the country was heading west to California, the Mormon battalion was turning its back on the gold and heading east. Our honor was at stake. With us, it was God and his kingdom first. Yet even as they were leaving, the Mormon battalion was to make one more contribution to the history of the West, blazing the trail across the Sierra Nevadas, which thousands of gold seekers would follow. It was a daunting prospect. It would be the highest overland wagon route in the continental US, but they were determined to find a way. June 17, 1848, Henry Bigler and two others set out to select a place of gathering. They found a spot they named Pleasant Valley, and the company gathered there to finish preparations. Daniel Browett was elected president of the company, and while the rest of the party was making preparations, he and Ezra Allen, along with Henderson Cox, went ahead to scout a trail along Iron Mountain Ridge to Carson Pass. They didn't return. Finally, the rest of the party headed off after them, 45 men and one woman, Melissa Corey. The country is rougher than first reports indicated. Brush and rocks give the wagons considerable difficulty in passing. Most of our time is consumed in working the road. Wednesday, July 19th discovered what looked like a shallow grave and dead campfire. We commenced to open it, and at the bottom, to our great horror, found the bodies of our three friends, divested of every article of clothing and exhibiting marks of terrible violence. In the grass, we found Ezra Allen's buckskin bag. As the murderers took off his clothing, the bag most likely slid into the grass. It was a time of mourning to think that the man that was to be our leader to Salt Lake was now lying dead. In all my journey with the battalion, this was the worst night. The company laid over a full day to prepare the grave of their friends, and Wilford Hudson carved an epitaph on a nearby tree. They named the place Tragedy Spring. Saturday, July 22nd, Rock Creek. The climb is even steeper now. Wagons continue to break down and need almost constant repair. 15 men work the road to the top of the mountain. July 29th, summit camp, two miles. Cliffs with sharp drops, very hard going. July 31st, Pass Canyon. Impossible to build a road through this canyon. We had no hammers nor drill with which we could do anything with the stones. It seemed almost an impossibility to go farther. Finally, someone suggested that we build a fire on the rocks. When the fire had died down, we found that as far as the heat had penetrated, the rocks were all broken in small pieces, which were soon removed with pick and shovel. 
Another fire was built with the same result. After three or four fires, we found that the rocks were not much in our way, and we soon had a good wagon road right over them. It took seven days to cut a wagon road through the canyon, about seven miles at one mile a day. But in 40 days, the party had blazed about 170 miles of wagon road across trackless terrain. For the next 16 years, thousands of gold and land seekers traveled this route. Thousands of people, wagons and livestock would come into California over the Mormon Trail. Thousands of weary immigrants would follow these battalion tracks. <music> Melissa and William and their comrades reached Salt Lake City October 6th 1848. They were home at last. Later that fall, Sarah Allen waited for Ezra's return. I looked forward to the time when his strong arms would lift these burdens from my shoulders, waiting and watching, listening to the sound of every footstep that approached my door. Word of Ezra's fate finally reached Sarah along with the pouch containing the gold. She used the gold to buy a wagon and supplies and bring her family west. But she reserved enough to make a wedding ring, which she wore the remainder of her life. Back in Salt Lake, William's health was failing. It was diagnosed as tuberculosis, brought on by the rigors of the journey. Nothing could be done for him. He had one wish, to live long enough to see the birth of the baby Melissa was carrying. A daughter was born the next February. William passed away March 7, 1849. Looking back on my life, I do not feel to complain. I think my trials are great, but we have hopes of meeting again where we will not be subject to separation. So ended a history-making adventure. William and Melissa, Ezra and Sarah, as well as hundreds of others, paid a costly price for their faith but the sacrifices they made live on. The country they explored, the cities they helped found, the roads they built, have become a legacy to future generations. Brigham Young's words were literally fulfilled. The Mormon Battalion will be held in honorable remembrance to the latest generation.